Hello and welcome back to Amaze Berlin 2022. On my side here is Frauke Stuhl. She's a project manager of Eine Welt in Bewegung. Action plan. Action plan um, for the Leibniz Research Museum, part of the Leipzig Leib Leibniz uh, Association. And um, I'm very, very happy to have you here in the studio because we have actually some history. So last year we did an amazing game jam. It was the first co cooperation with the Leibniz Association. And um, it was a game jam. It was the Amaze Museum's online game jam. And we brought game developers from all over the world yes. together. Yes, yes, Who created like games um, with the objects and with the narratives of the museums. Um, Rauke will tell a little bit more about it, but it was really, really good. We had 14 games at, in the end, mm -hmm. and uh, um, over 40 participants from all the world. And uh, we had a panel discussion about games in museum, the games, uh, mu museums and playful media. And uh, as well at the award show, you were presenting kind of the shortlist or yeah, we couldn't the best decide. selection, or I don't know. Yes. And and they I think one great. of the games also was finished, right? Well, they were all you could. They were all all playable. But one and you. F mm, yeah, we we're still, we still yeah yeah, yeah we will. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so last year was so good that we met again after the festival and said, "Oh, it was such a great experience. We do it again." Yes. Are you doing a festival? And I said, "Yes, I do a festival." Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, but we don't want to do a game jam anymore. So, no. But I mean, Amaze is not a game festival only, it's also a playful media festival, and we thought augmented reality is the thing. We want to talk about augmented reality. And now we are here, and we had before the festival, um, on the 11th and the 12th of uh, uh, May, a hackathon as well with international artists, and uh, uh, they created augmented reality works. And that's why Frauke is now here <laughs> and wants to talk about the project. And uh, I like to thank uh, Leibniz Association and as well thank you to you and also the team uh, at Leibniz Association because as well they're, they were experts, right? I mean, they, they, they helped the developers um, through the hackathon and, and also give their expertise to them. And uh, it was really, really good. And um, the results are fantastic, I've heard. And uh, yeah, I give the mic now over to Frauke. Yes. And uh, um, yeah, it's your stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having us again this year on this um, wonderful Amaze Festival. And yes, like uh, uh, Thorsten already said, um, now we're going to have a little talk about augmented reality and the museums. And um, but just a few sentences also to this um, hackathon. We wanted uh, to create um, our AR experiences to um, bring the objects to life, to make the invisible visible in the museum and also show maybe um, the relationship with our animal friends and en en enemies. And um, what came out of it, the top three, we're going to show at the award show on Tuesday, so stay tuned. To get a little bit an idea of what we did at this um, hackathon, we show a small recap video um, just now. Yeah, welcome to the Amaze Museum's AR online hackathon. It's the second time we do something together with the Leibniz Research Museum. I'm Frauke, I'm the conceptualizer and the coordinator of Action Plan. The Leibniz Association connects 97 independent research institutions and these research um, institutions include eight special research museums. The Deutsches Bergbau Museum. Deutsches Museum in Munich. The German Maritime Museum. The Römisch-Germanisches Zentralmuseum. 
LIB, Natural History Museum of Görlitz, the Germanisches Nationalmuseum. Okay, we like to introduce our coach team. My name is Ines. I'm Anjin. My name is Renja Anhut. The hackathon topic is AR, you ready? Let's bring science, nature, and culture to life with AR technology. We have nearly 30 participants from 16 different countries. This hackathon, we see a perfect opportunity to bring the incredible world of our air and museums. I can't wait to get started. Let's get through all the presentation as fast as possible. So we are working Instagram filter to push it up and then you see the solar clips. This uh, idea is a more generalized format for immersive experiences in existing 3D models. We spoke about the idea of encryption and the decryption process. Uh, we picked the story of Millie Beeson and her story is about how she became a pilot and the uh, difficulties she encountered while doing so. We are working on this lens about this bug sitting on your wrist, like a little preview. Cool. Yes. Yeah, um, you can keep hacking. We'll Yes, and the full video and, of course, the nice um, projects you can um, see on our website and as well as on itch.io. And I want to thank you, the filmmaker, Tatiana Vela de Santos, also for this great little recap. Now, we start the talk. Our fantastic moderator, Geraldine de Bastion, will talk with the participants um, of the Hackathon, um, Vladimir Storm, um, a visual artist, and also mentors from the um, museum side. This is um, Antje Kluge-Pinska and Johannes Sauter. And also we have a special guest, AR artist Nadine Koletzi. They will talk about augmented reality and museums in a short. Geradine, our fantastic moderator, a moderator um, is a co-founder of the consultancy Connective which advises various organizations um, on digital transformation. And she is also the founder of the Global Innovation Gathering in which she connects innovators from all over the world. But last but not least, every year she is a highly requested and popular curator and coordinator and moderator of the International Net Conference, Republica. And now, Geraldine, are, A, are we ready? Now we're live. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction, Frauke. I'm nearly blushing a little bit because it was so nice. And yes, we are ready here and we're looking forward to kicking off our panel discussion. What does a 300-year-old sextant look like up close? Or how did it work? How did dinosaurs move? Or what would you look like in a Rococo costume? There are so many countless applications thinkable that AR can be used in museums to ex heighten the experience that we have. But the question is, how can they really be integrated effectively? What implications does this have for the future of museums? And also what kind of knowledge can really be conveyed well or even better through AR? Those are some of the questions that we want to address in the panel. But as was correctly said, we also want to deep dive and learn more about the highlights and outcomes of the hackathon that just took part as uh, as was described already as part of the Amaze Festival. So I'm thrilled to be moderating the session on behalf of the Leibniz Association's Research Museums Action Plan and would now like to introduce you to our four distinguished panelists in just a little bit more detail. I'm warmly welcoming Antje Kluger-Pinska to the discussion. She is head of the education department at the Roman Germanic Central Museum in Mainz and her areas of work include topics around science, pedagogy, mediation, exhibition didactics, historical learning, as well as archaeology of play and archaeology of gender, all fascinating topics, I think. Thanks so much for joining our discussion today, Antje. Hello, welcome. Thank you. 
Also, a warm welcome to Johanna Sauter, who is Research Associate at the Research Institute for the His History of Technology and Science, Deutsche Museum Digital, and has been in this position since 2018, researching different topics around digital humanities, digital art history, research infrastructures, and open data. It's great to have you here, Johannes. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward. Me too. Also a warm welcome to Nadine Kolotsky, a visual artist based in Frankfurt and Berlin and working on the intersection of digital and analog combining different kinds of materials such as plastic and pixels to create different kinds of works, hand cut, melted, transform into walkable augmented reality environments. So the perfect visual artist to comment on the topics that we're working on here. She's also been working um, deep diving into AR and big scale installations and been doing projects in other countries such as Japan. It's great to have you here with us today, Nadine. Thank you all. And last but not least, I'd like to warmly welcome Vladimir Storm, who's a creative director and visual artist. He focuses on games and interactive media, NFTs and digital fashion, as well as AR and VR storytelling, and has worked in numerous projects, tech and art projects worldwide, in yeah, over 20 countries with clients such as Microsoft, Netflix, Valve, and Snapchat. Great to have you here, Vladimir. Thank you for the intro. So you are one of the many people who took part of the hackathon really from all over the world. And I would love to start the conversation by learning from you. How did you even decide to take part on this? What was your motivation to join the group and be part of this hackathon? Uh, I can start with uh, with this. I think it's very interesting to bring kind of traditional media, traditional institutes, uh, and reintroduce them to like for younger generations, for kind of new audiences. And uh, augmented reality is fairly still fairly new medium, and I think it's an interesting opportunity to collaborate with the traditional institutes and kind of exchange knowledge and uh, ways of like storytelling and um, narratives and kind of um, try to bring it to like kind of make it more contemporary and make it more interesting uh, so it was definitely interesting uh, experience yeah and walk me through it a little bit. What were the key outcomes and what was also the project that you were working on as part of the hackathon? Mm, I, can, I can tell about the project uh, we were working as a team. Um, when uh, all these different museums introduced themselves, uh, there was this uh, one exhibition which uh, I found quite interesting. Uh, they had all these different animals which live in, um, in the soil. Um, but they made a kind of this big install physical installation with this big box and if and um they also made the vr experience with all this like kind of soil creatures and i found that would be very interesting to kind of bring uh, this whole uh installation a part of it to augmented reality and put some life into these creatures that they're not just like uh, statically there, but like you kind of can interact with them. And what we ended up building um, is a tiny like character which sits on your hand, like this tiny bug, and uh, tells a story about their uh, like species. Uh, so it's kind of like um, narration through like this kind of digital mascot, digital character, which I found like a maybe an interesting bridge between this like a traditional storytelling in a museum space and a more contemporary kind of digital gamified storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd highly recommend our, our audience to check out the results because they're online and the, the, the creature you created or the application you created, people can go and check it out, which, um, like I said, I highly recommend doing. I think it's a lovely idea, but it was also great to see the really bandwidth of different kind of solutions coming out from the hackathon. I would love to ask you, Antje, and then also, of course, you, Johannes, how um, surprised or not surprised were you by the outcomes and what was the experience of taking part in the hackathon like for you? Do you want to start, Antje? 
Yeah, uh, I do. Um, thank you. Um, I'm so enthusiastic about the results um, representing the different uh, possible applications of AR uh, in museums. And I think uh, each of the project has, uh, is in has inspiring moments, uh, including and not least uh, Vladi's uh, wood lights, um, talking, talk, talking to the visitors and showing them their, uh, its life. So, um, um, it's worthwhile participating for, for I think, each of the, the Leibniz uh, research museums. And are there things, if I can just stay with you for one yeah. more question, that you feel you will be able to take away for your work or sort of new points of inspiration on how to look at AR? I'm imagining, due to the historical objects and the museum context that you work in, that many applications might seem quite obvious, like I mentioned the sextant yeah. in the introduction, but maybe there are other applications that aren't so obvious as well. Um, I mean, we, we saw applications that contextualize objects in action, and actually we as archaeologists, we, we investigate objects, but we investigate them to understand human existence and human action. So this contextualization is important for us. Um, and um, that's one point. And then we have um, the, uh, the storytelling, which uh, is shown um, among others by, by Vladimir. And um, storytelling is a, a very um, important topic at the moment in historical storytelling, which is always critical as well because um, there is always the danger of simplifying or uh, recreating stereotypes by uh, recounting the same stories over and over again, which is something we want to avoid. But I just think that um, we have examples here which uh, show how to avoid this. And uh, it make, makes me think about, um, well, kind of finding, finding um, interesting solutions for storytelling, which fit our purpose and which uh, fit our claim to, um, to inspire people uh, to think, to thought about their own lives through storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that classification around the contextualization and the storytelling and narrative. I think that's very helpful. Johannes, I would like to ask you also, what were your sort of key takeaways from the hackathon? Um, any surprises to you in the things that were created? Well, first of all, I was, I was uh, it's always interesting for us to see how a, pot a potential audience would, would like to engage with the museum, what they are interested in, not just what we think is important, what's the, the, the very special part that we want to transfer, that we want to, to, to teach about, but to see what's what's important for for the audience. What do they like, and what what's their narrative, so to say? And uh, what I really uh, got out of the hackathon uh, was that many projects, not just Vladimir's, which was like a very good example for for what many projects did, was like a, a really direct connection between the visitor and the object. So usually, when you go into a museum, you see things, but you're not allowed to touch them, to experience them in a in a like uh, in different ways and and um, the, this bug sitting on your wrist is not standing in front of you but it's sitting on your body and gets like an immediate uh, connection between you and the object and then telling you something about itself or where it's from the soil and and it's I mean this is transferable this could as, as well be a, a, um, a steam machine with google uh, with buggy eyes that, that tells you something so the, the from from that point on you can extend it in in all directions and I it's not just one example from quite a few that that really broke this gap between the object and the visitor and like really combined them brought them together and uh, like uh, this is something that struck me quite interesting that uh, there's a need or maybe an interest for being in touch with the object absolutely and it's very nicely uh, said being in touch with the object literally <laughs> Um, I want to bring you in as well, Nadine. We've already heard from a couple of different ways that AR can be used in museum context. Why do you think it's important that these communities and cultures come together in a, in a context like this hackathon? Yeah, yeah. I uh, want to quickly um, directly add to Johannes' uh, thoughts that it is really about creating an experience and um, 
asking um, the users or the visitors or give authority back to them to explore something in their own ways and perspective and to get in touch with it is I think something is, um, in particular AR can do like no other medium since it is as the name indicates something which brings together the world of information and digital and the here and now reality and uh, with the example of the bug it is interacting on your body so you will save it as a memory rather than an image or a film you've uh, you've been watching and that's something which is kind of connecting or uh, how you say activating your brain cells in a different way and i think uh, that's particularly what a uh, hackathon is about that you throw in all of your ideas that you exchange and that you create something which is a lasting memory and also an experience which is inviting others to have their first person how you say take on it so it's not something which is consumed passively and I think there are so many qualities in those aspects and I guess this is kind of a melting pot format um, or like we, we mentioned it before uh, maybe the best soil um, to uh, develop the possibilities here yeah so it seems I want to ask a question um, because it seems to me that the cultural gap, let's say, isn't too big. Like um, sometimes when you bring together expert communities and the actual designers and technologists for a hackathon, there can be quite a big cultural gap. But Vladimir, maybe you can share your expression, your experiences, how this was in this hackathon. It seems to me like there's also already a lot of common and mutual understanding for the use of IAR in museums here. Yeah, I can I can tell about this. Uh, I think in this particular um, hackathon, it was really cool to exchange uh, knowledge and already like kind of ways of storytelling with the museum we, we're working with. And um, I want to also say uh, the there is just difference maybe in uh, storytelling between like kind of generation because like I, I've been researching a lot like lately about like kind of Gen Z Gen Alpha um, you know like making stories or like experiences for Gen Z Gen Alpha basically for kids and like teenagers and um, the culture of consumption culture of uh, kind of interaction and learning changed uh, very a lot like uh, for, for younger generation now like you know younger uh, people they you know used to play games and use like mobile phones on a regular basis which wasn't like for example even for me when i was growing up and it's very important to understand uh, contemporary ways of storytelling, like through video games, through interactive experiences, uh, the knowledge could be the same. The, the message which museums trying to bring to the audience could be the same, but the ways of storytelling uh, changed. And especially because the younger audience, they used to just different ways of learning, like through like when, you know, they playing video games using augmented reality, uh, and uh, I think museums uh, should adapt to this new ways of storytelling, making experiences more interactive and uh, more like gamified and let, uh, you know, uh, people who come to museum be co-creators of the experience and like kind of like that it's uh, not should be just like kind of way that you're coming to a class in the school and you're listening, it should be like a mutual kind of interactions um with the experience um and in this uh, particular case again like just coming back to the this hackathon uh it was quite good like the interactions and like collaborations with the museum because the information the knowledge we wanted to show through the augmented reality experience it's already was there they prepared like a really cool website with all the information we just like try to um, uh, bring it to the visitor in a different way. And I think these collaborations should really happen more often, like when uh, museums and uh, like augmented reality developers or like game developers, they should come together and really learn from each other. Like, and I think uh, this, this gap, like especially generation gap should be like kind of uh, closed and yeah, <laughs> the exchange should happen more often. 
Yeah, I think we're all a big, uh, big fans of that idea of having these formats, not just as a one off event, but something that is more embedded, let's say, in institutional cooperation and and developing both for the gamers, as you said, as well as the museums in terms of being formats that are ongoing. Um, so it'd be great maybe to take this as a point of inspiration also to develop some of these formats. But I want to ask you, Antje, some of these topics that Vladimir was just addressing in terms of the generational different kind of learning needs. I'm sure that you're also thinking about these things in terms of, yes, like the didactics for your exhibitions. Um, how are you addressing them? Um, well, being the, the fossil in this round, um, probably the, the one most remote from digital devices, but not, not really, really. I, I'm, I'm always um, open to uh, new things. Um, and um, at the moment, we're just uh, planning our new exhibitions. Um, actually, most of our exhibitions are closed at the moment to be reopened later on. And uh, we do have a digital concept for the exhibition as well. Uh, actually, um, augmented reality is not in the center of this concept, but interaction. And augmented reality can be one tool to uh, not only to transfer knowledge, but also to create, uh, to create a, a level of discourse, in particular with young people. They might want to talk to, rather talk to, to your wood lights than to me about things. And your wood lights might, might, might be able to address even critical points. I mean, in its coexistence with, uh, with humanity, which might pose problems to its existence. So, and I think uh, such a, um, such a character uh, can, can, can contribute to that. Um, saying at the same time that sometimes, I mean, it's very common to create characters to address people in museums. And it's not at all a very new idea, but um, sometimes they're awkward and, um, well, kind of, um, what shall I say? Um, um, you don't want to be reminded of the Microsoft. Tantalizing, maybe. Yeah, and so, I think uh, your wood lice isn't. It's completely mm -hmm. on insight, and that's what I like about it. So um, of our AR and a storytelling creature, let's say, as a mediator between uh, the science and, and the public is a really good idea. If, but it is not easy to find the right character. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, Antje, I didn't mean to interrupt you at all. I was just going to offer the character example if we don't want uh, the experience, let's say, of the Microsoft paperclip, which has always been a bit cringy, revoked in AR museums, but obviously to take this down a, a cooler path, let's say. Um, yeah. Johannes, maybe some of these cultural gaps didn't exist during the hackathon because um, you're all already, as, as Antje as well, thinking about these applications, but I know that the Deutsche Museum is also already gaining different experiences with digital, digital applications. So maybe you can give us some examples of these and how they relate to the context of the hackathon as well. Well, um, first of all, the, the idea to get closer together with artists and, and uh, in general or um, um, 3D and AR artists is, is something that we are working on quite uh, um, intensive in the last years. And um, we are, are about to open a media lab of sorts which is exactly that. It's like, like a co-creational working space where we could invite artists and, and startups and, uh, and all these, uh, these people who are really good with the techniques and, and have a, a other, another perspective and we can uh, learn from each other and we can share our objects and share what we have, our stories, uh, the, the, the building itself. Like we have quite some uh, visitors a year and this is always a nice evaluation platform for everyone. Um, uh, for example, a, a tool like a it's, it's similar to Google Street View. It's like a, this this digital helmet with uh, with a camera and 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 um, uh, a group work uh, walk through the whole museum and digitized the whole museum into a point cloud, and gave us the results. And we could uh, have the results, and they have the the learnings from digitizing such a huge hall and and different uh, from sometimes hard to digitize objects. So they have a learning and we have the results. That's like a, a very good idea and, and, and expect an example for this co-creational um, work that we are really aiming for. 
So this is like the one part that is interesting for us. The second is, I mean, we all learned so much in the last two years. I mean, the digital gap shortened and, and got smaller just because we had to, like we were forced to stay in, in house. We, have, we were forced to, to, to not go to the museums. And um, the Dutch Museum was very lucky because this very uh, um, project digitizing the whole museum was just finished with the start of the pandemic. So uh, at the time, so, so we could really um, have an, an offer for, for some, someone at home losing its mi his mind because uh, staying at home all the time. So they could stroll through the museum as they would do uh, when they could uh, go into, into the real museum. And we had like so many click and numbers, like so many people visited our virtual museum that showed us that there's, I mean, there is a gap, but it got smaller because it, it, we were forced to, but on the same time, it's, I, I don't want all, like just to uh, nail it onto the, the pandemic experience we all had uh, or have. Um, I think there's the gap is getting smaller and smaller any any ways because I mean the the digital this, this whole media the, the smartphone as a, as our mirror to to the internet and to the world is something that all of us have like this it gets smaller and smaller I, I'd say just to say it. and the experiences we have is when we when we um, launch an, a new app for the museum people download it it's not that we have to force them to <laughs> to try it out but they are willingly doing it themselves so. Yeah, that's great. And it's great to hear that these different formats are just being taken up by the target groups, respectively, as you explained. And mm -hmm. just, you know, when I'm on your website and I see your digital catalog with the different things and tools, and it just, it's so obvious to see how many different educational opportunities this open up, opens up to people um, outside of the, of course, important fact that they can visit them in the museum, but the fact that they can reach them online, of course, it just makes it more egalitarian in a way as well. Um, it was great. Now we've outlined a little bit some of the outcomes of the hackathon and some of the activities in the museums. I'd like to open it up to speak a bit more generally also exactly about how these learning and educational effects can best take place using um, AR. So Nadine, of course, here we want to also profit from your experience and your yeah, your work experience. So perhaps you can, um, yeah, just give your general impression. Where's the technology at today? And where do you see the potentials developing in the next couple of years? I'm asking this because I think we all see the potentials. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's also this critical idea that things can become quite gimmicky. Also, as Antje just said, like depending mm -hmm. on how a character, for instance, is made, but mm -hmm. also in terms of, sort of technology readiness. So how would you assess that? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, happy you brought up uh, this question because it actually ties in um, what we've been talking about before that the pandemic forced us to work from home and uh, live kind of a simulation of what could be, but I think AR in particular is not really simulating something it's really um, creating another way of like a very physical um, experience like you have to get in touch as a body and as um like a person which has uh, a surrounding so it's not something which is only um working on a screen it is a, a connecting point to the real world and i think it's really interesting that both parts come together uh, in this technology and i was developing uh, an um, ar treasure hunt for a museum in zoling um for uh, during the last months of the um, pandemic season let's call it like that and i think uh, what is um or what we have to have in mind is that this medium is still very young and to have a bigger platform with a lot of resources that is just happening now or there are some things in development which we can witness maybe now in the next weeks so i think um the gimmicky part is maybe um the feeling we have as those first glimpses of what is possible so it looks a bit more um, playful or maybe not that deep at first sight but um, I think it's only uh, that it needs some more time um, to let that um, more how you say invested projects grow and be finalized and be out there to really explore um, what um, for example a half an hour experience can about um, like let's take the example of the museum of the different uh, rooms uh, of that old um, uh, how you say iron building factory and it really takes you through a path for example uh, it moves your body um, it can also connect things you can find in the surrounding um, for example um, I think that's maybe a leading direction um, that uh, 
um, AR hunt I was creating, it's working with an AI in the background, which is also asking you to um, take away the screen and focus on your surrounding. For example, find uh, an energy source, and then you have to take a look, like where is energy in this place? So it's not really only adding decorative assets or funny gimmicky characters. It's also leading your thoughts and your uh, vision. And I think those examples we haven't witnessed a lot of them yet because I think they're all in development right now um, but I think this is like a totally different I say dimension it could be like the animated GIF and a movie it's a, a very different topic of how much depth content um, knowledge um, perspective you can include in that depending on that volume or the complexity and I think we're just on the cusp of uh, what is possible there and yeah, I think that is basically um, a perfect kickoff to uh, embrace the new possibility. And I um, also had the feeling like uh, Johannes was pointing out that the museums are very ready and also the audiences, they're really eager to see what is possible. And they've just had kind of this, let's call it appetizers of, oh, it is playful. It is very uh, a natural approach to something very technological. Uh, and I think that's uh, actually a perfect fit to um, um, include more uh, knowledge, questions, um, and open a forum maybe where you are an active part in it. And I think the gamification will lose its, um, how you say, gimmicky um, appearance as soon as you spend more time in a one AR experience, for example. Yeah. Super interesting. Thank you so much. Before before we, because I'm getting carried away with everything that you're sharing. Um, no, no, not at all. I just wanted to, to, to say to our audience that they're also allowed to ask questions that will be conveyed to me via chat. So you're uh, welcome to do so, even though <laughs> we are already um, running away with the conversation, as I said, because it's so interesting, all the points that you're just sharing. I want to uh, from what you just said, Nadine, mm, to go back to the point of contextualization that Antje mm -hmm. made earlier, and also open this up to the rest of the panel, because I've been thinking also in preparation, of course, of today, what is new about the use of VR or AR in museum context? Like what can be kinds of knowledge shared that perhaps weren't easy to share in the museum context before? So for instance, what did a a uh, historical square in just to stay with ancient Rome sound like, you know, not just looking at ancient depictions perhaps, but to create mm -hmm. these other layers basically. So mm -hmm. again, I would be super interested to hear uh, thoughts from the panel um, mm -hmm. about what can be the new things that are added and what can potentially things be that can get lost as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first, Nadine, and then we'll yeah, pass I, it around? <laughs> I'm allowed. I, I will Please. try to keep it short. <clears throat> One major topic which we didn't address really is uh, that can, it can also happen in urban surroundings or in your homes. So it's kind of opening up the space. So this is something which is uh, another huge game changer um, because the narrative parts can be found maybe on different places in the city leading to the museum, for example. So you can really include uh, a way bigger map, like physical map into the experience and learning. Uh, so this would be, I think, one major point. And another thing which is interesting is that you can create forums where visitors could also leave their thought or their message or their um, worries about a theme. So um, this, maybe we know it from the classic guest book, but that was not really something to exchange um, opinions. It was more like that you, you've been here and you're kind of leaving a mark. And I think those, those are um, like really big chapters, new chapters, uh, especially AR is bringing um, uh, an additional to the ways uh, how storytelling can be transformed into an experience. Yeah. And I think that's a really good points that you made also in terms of just increasing the different kind of interaction formats um, that are possible with mm -hmm. audiences. Vladimir, is this something that you also thought about um, in the context of the hackathon or maybe also in general, like what are different kind of learnings, new learning um, layers that be, can be created through the use of these technologies? Uh, I think, uh, as Nadine mentioned, is like there's like um, it's still like quite early, but very like lately getting really mature technology, and uh, there's like so many new applications coming, and uh, it's very exciting time to see what what um, people and like artists like creating. And uh, I don't think 
if, for example, we would consider city space like city spaces and um, augment like some city locations, uh, I don't think it will uh, lose something from uh, what is exist before. It's more gonna augment like uh, places, and um, <laughs> just like and. Um, so I think in the future, the experiences will be hybrid. It's not going to be completely digital or completely like physical. It's going to be a constant interchange and like uh, kind of referencing from digital to physical and vice versa. And uh, in, for example, in the city locations, it could be you can see the past or the future. You can bring life to places. You can, uh, again, like, like make some alive characters or like so you just basically augment the real like uh, spaces and I don't know, I think augmented reality we will still will see what uh, next year's uh, artists will create, but it's very interesting time right now. Yeah, absolutely. Johannes, please, you wanted to comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Just that you have said it, because if not, I would have said it. It's, it's never a question of one or the other. So it's never a question of is the digital like... Uh, kicking out the original and we close the museums and stay at home and have our experiences. That's never the case, never the question, that's never the idea. It's always it, it perfectly, uh, uh, as you said, Vladimir, it's the extension. It is, it is something that we can add on what we have. We, we always want to show the original objects and people want to see the original objects. That's not the question at all. And, and to, um, to extend the, the story behind the object is something that museums have done all the time. This is just a new tool that like, opens up so many possibilities but um but for example the deutsches museum had um some experiences way before technology technology era we had uh, and still have these dioramas which is like a show like a, a small box that shows how the this object would have been in an in a proper position like in a functional context um because it's when for us as a technology a techni technic technical museum uh, what we do is we take an object that has a function and put it out of this functional context and put it into an aesthetic context. It's just something that we show now, so nothing that, that, that for, do, does something. It's just, it stands there. So what we are always interested in is to show how it usually was, what was the functional context. And so with, with this dior uh, diorama, we would have done this in a, in a very uh, old school way, like show uh, uh, the, this, a, a miniature of it how it would have looked, but it still is, is a static thing. And with VR, we are what we've done, uh, we've done the last years in our VR lab. Um, what we did was taken one object and put it back into a functional context. And with the VR um, um, experiences, people could walk through this, uh, this old fabric uh, building and see how this steam machine was working and was loud. There was like an audio and an audacity um, and, and, and uh, you could hear something. So there was this trigger and you could, you could not smell it, but you could almost smell it, uh, the, the, the oils and all these things. And, and it was working and there was like these, these, uh, these uh, um, things that it powered and you could see how it was. That, that's the original, the functional context. And so VR gave, uh, gave us this, this possibility to, to show the object in, this, in its proper context. And, and AR is, is um, giving us so much more uh, possibilities because now we can, we can like use the original object and augment it with information on how it worked, for example, like show how the, the, uh, the hot steam came in, did something and cold steam get, uh, got out and things like that. So we, could, we can extend and, and augment the, the, the objects we have and put them into a functional context again. Um, what we st even can do is take the diorama, so take this, the, the thing that showed how something that we have was working and augment the diorama. So now we can like make people walk through uh, this, this tiny miniature landscape and make them do things. And that's just great. That's, that's something that kids love, but it's, it's also something that, uh, that an adult would like to see because it shows so much more what like to, to tell the story behind the object. That's always the, the, the thing we want to do. I love dioramas. Um, Nadine, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to add there's also haptical feedback uh, with AR. So you could add a vibration, for example, if you encounter, I don't know, maybe there are flying bugs. And if you dodge on one, uh, you will have a haptical feedback. And I think um, those are like things which make it not only interactive, but multi sensory. And I think this is 
something uh, AR maybe brings in a different way than VR, where you kind of isolate it uh, in the glasses. So I guess this is a, a bit more uh, um, explorative. And another thing I wanted to add is uh, real life data. So museums are often kind of giving access or accessibility to things how they used to be or uh, to understand the present. Um, there is always, of course, a connection uh, shown to the past, but also museums could maybe embrace more what's actually happening, like live tickers, a live number is coming in, how many people are in the museum could change um, the acoustics, for example. So uh, it could work uh, with the here and now reality as a source of data and information and visualize or make them experienceable. <laughs> Let's put it like that, since it's not only visually um, sensible. And those are things which are quite interesting and also asking back how real can a digital component or extrusion augmentation be um, if, for example, it is maybe connected to the weather outside or if it's connected to the season, um, then it, it maybe indicates that there is a time in the digital simulation as well. Um, so there are a lot of aspects which are just yet to come and to be discovered and included in this um, new ways of storytelling, especially in museums looking into the future now and not being so hesitant with their precious objects and historical mm -hmm. uh, houses. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to ask one I want to squeeze in two more questions especially also on the um handling objects um point that you just made but first I'll let Antje comment. Oh, well I, I wanted to stress that there's we don't see any danger in introducing digital techniques into our museums not at all and you see myself sitting in the captain's cabin <laughs> um, of a late Roman uh, ship which is, uh, you, you can see in our museum uh, as a, an analogous model one-to-one. -one. And I think these uh, the combination of uh, analogous models and things, things you can touch sometimes, and the combination of uh, augmented reality and touch of real things um, really uh, just opens up new experiences. So um, I think museums are not afraid anymore. Yeah, I really also feel there's been um, a shift, let's say, over the last five years, definitely in these communities moving together and the um, openness and the discussion from all sides concerned. And that's really fantastic and so encouraging to see. Let me ask um, maybe just two also questions looking perhaps at the challenges or critical sides before we close. So uh, one question would be how do you make sure as these technologies are advancing and become more powerful and looking ahead into the future that they're dealt with in a responsible way so for instance meeting historical figures is a possibility or maybe some of you have heard about the immersive news contexts um, that journalists like Nani de la Pena created to create emotions and people to experience something, especially in our information oversaturated society, where we're seldom perhaps, uh, yeah, really touched or shocked by something with the overflow of things. So um, maybe also to Antje, especially in historical context that you're dealing with, how would you approach such topics or um, maybe also create, and I'm sure this is also what you're doing, larger strategies around the use of these things to make sure they are applied in a responsible manner also. Um, you mentioned first, first person stories and historical personalities. Well, as archaeologists, we often don't have the persons, just the relics and, but no matter how, how um, that, but um, um, I think you have to be responsible not to raise emotions uh, and direct them very uh, in, one, in one direction. And I think uh, storytelling sometimes, even if you want to create proximity, you have to take care of alienation as well. Uh, for uh, like like your your wood lice, you know. Again, um, it has uh, had has a quality because it's uh, it's clearly. Uh, a character that is not real and it talks, everybody knows that wood lice don't talk, but uh, that makes it clear how it's, uh, that the creation of this character is clear. And it doesn't pretend to be a real wood lice, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a character. And uh, I think you have to be even more careful with historical personalities. Um, because you create strong pictures, uh, which tend, I said that before, to create stereotypes. 
So we once uh, placed a historical personality whose uh, funeral we uh, uh, showed in an exhibition and um, uh, we transferred his story into modern times. So we made out of the King, uh, the King Claudvish, he was an early medieval king, um, we told his story just taking over the, the power in, in his kingdom after the death of his father just by transferring his person into uh, a present day surroundings. We didn't use our then, but just films and texts and um, Facebook accounts and something like that. But that, that created an al alienation which uh, enables people to, to come into discussion. And uh, on the other hand, taking him as a fifth century uh, person would uh, keep him locked down, locked in a historical surrounding which you can't really reach even with not with our AR. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes you need a line nation or build another a creative bridge uh, to, into the past. Yeah, thank you. That's super insightful. Um, Johannes, you raised your hand. Maybe I can just connect it to the question also, which I see is one of the maybe challenges at the moment to create capacity to, to handle such things also within your staff and your team. So please comment and maybe you can combine. Yeah, that's a perfect, a perfect uh, segue for me because I wanted to add what Antje said that it's uh, even though this technology is AR, VR is something that we in this panel, we know this technology and we tried it and, and we always one might think that it's something everyone had now had a uh, head mounted device uh, on and, and experienced it. But the, the, tr the truth is, or the experiences we have in our VR lab is that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So people are really, it's, it's a new technology. I mean, as Nadine said, people are open for it, but they haven't experienced it yet. So what we have uh, to, to take care of and, and really take care of is not just um, um, like, not to overwhelm the visitor with what they can experience. Because when, as soon as they, this is experience we all ha had in, in, in the VR lab. As soon as they have this, this head mounted displays on, they are completely lost. So mm -hmm. if, if you, and it's, it's, it starts with like the easiest tasks. If like you, they have this, this controller in their hand and they have the head mounted displays. And through this head mounted display, they can see the controller, but not their hand. This confuses people. It's, it's the truth. It's, it, they, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, if you like, okay. And now there's like a trigger on your index finger. And then they move their their third uh, finger or their thumb because it's it's this this whole um, uh, finger and eye co coordination that we learned for the for for our whole life is a little stressed in this in this VR. So we have to take care of of uh, not to overwhelm the visitor in this VR experiences. Same applies on AR in my experiences. And and um, as you just said, uh, Geraldine, it is crucial to have people standing there and taking care of the visitor. Mm -hmm. So VR in our experiences is like one-to-one -one, uh, taking care of. Like if there's one pe uh, person having the, the head mounted displays on, there has to be someone from the staff from the Dutch Museum to take care of him. And, and, and the same thing is if you just uh, put the, the head mounted displays on a, a podest on a, some, on a, like on a, somewhere in the museum, people would, will not know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So you have to tell them the story. You have to show them how the technology works. In the Deutsches Museum, it's kind of quite easy because uh, a head-mounted display for the Deutsches Museum is an object itself. Because we are a technical museum, we, we like to show the, tech, the technology uh, um, changes and advances or, uh, anyway. So we can show them the head-mounted displays and how it works, and then what they can see in it, how objects used to work. So we can make uh, like different layers of explanation. But yeah, it, it's, it's so important to know and it's important for museums and for maybe funding to know that this is nothing that we can just implement and then leave people with it. It has to be taken care of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish we had more time. We are running out of time. I hope we get another opportunity to continue the discussion because for me, it's been fascinating to listen to you. I want to allow both Vladimir and Nadine a sort of one sentence future vision closing statement, um, especially because uh, on this whole user journey experience that you were just outlining, Johannes, and because you, Nadine, um, said something earlier about the autonomy and personalization for the user. And when you said that, I was thinking like, oh, I, for one, I really dislike these audio guides sort of 
you know, dictating you through the museum mm -hmm. and try to avoid them wherever possible. But I also always feel like, oh, am I missing out on something? So maybe I can ask uh, the closing question to you, Vladimir, and to you, Nadine. What's your vision? How should this go to make sure that the ARR guides we're creating are not <laughs> like these audio guides? What would your alternative for this look like? Do you want to start, Vladimir, and then I'll pass it to Nadine to close with? Ah, oh, that's uh, <laughs> not an easy one. I, I think um, like the guides and like what um, Johannes said, uh, like the problem right now we have that we have to guide people through the experiences. I think it's a, a generation problem in the first place because I've been exhibiting VR pieces and AR pieces for the last like seven years. And uh, younger generation kids, they usually don't have problem with the experiences because they used to video games, they used to like mobile phones, they used to all these devices. And it's like for them, for them, it's way more easier to dive into the new experiences. And uh, we still need guides to <laughs> bring older like uh, generation people to, to this technology. But like, I think it's the same what happened with mobile phones when, with everything else. When the technology is more mature, when younger generation will grow up with this technology there won't be this uh, problem and it's the same will be like with video games and i think uh, in the future it will be way way easier we won't have all these problems right now it's just a transition and kind of yeah baby steps kind of technology <laughs> thank you vladimir and then for the closing over to unity yeah yeah i think i would point out i isolation versus community, um, because I think this audio guides you mentioned, but also VR from my perspective, is something which is kind of shielding you away from the others and you're maybe you're in the museum by yourself or maybe you're there with um, friends uh, colleagues a uh, family and I think it's always um, a scary moment to be somewhere alone, especially if it's a new technology, and I think uh, augmented reality is Kind of doing the opposite it's opening up uh, kind of a playground inviting others to participate uh, often you can share a moment or an, an effect together uh, or it has a reference to your surroundings so i would kind of which might be a radical position put them as opposite angel devil <laughs> um kind of like how you say um, and antagonists and mm -hmm. both have the qualities uh, depending on what you want to say if you want to simulate something in a very intense way maybe VR is better but I think AR is kind of um, inclusive and I think that's why it has maybe more potential for the future or it's something um, yeah which will surround us and connect us also and that's a big quality. What a beautiful sentiment to close on. I'd like to thank the four of you so much for sharing your insights and experiences. It was fascinating to listen to. And of course, a big thank you to Amaze Festival and Leibniz Association Research Museum Action Plan for making this session possible. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.